Hey, Vineyard Church. My name is Mark Scalia, and I'm one of the ministry leaders here at the Vineyard. If it's your first time joining us online, please take a moment to like, follow, or subscribe to our channel, as that's probably the easiest way to keep up with what's going on in and around the Vineyard Church of New Orleans. As we come together today and prepare our hearts for worship, I want to encourage you to bring all that you are to God. In Isaiah 61, God promises to take everything that we bring to him and transform that into new creation. Despair into dancing, mourning into laughter, ashes into beauty. So whatever it is today, whether it's frustration you're feeling, or whether it's joy, a day of joy you've experienced, whether it's anxiety of what this new normal really means, or whether it's just some unexplainable peace that you have in the moment, whether it's fear of health or finances, or maybe just a spirit of gratitude for today, whether it's loneliness or grief, or maybe it's just silly times with family, cutting each other's hair in the backyard until barbershops open again. Whatever it is, bring all that you are to God and you will find everything that you need through the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now let's join together in a time of worship. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe you are the way. protector you are the one I love I believe you are the way the truth the light I believe you are the way the truth the light our minds on the love of God, the presence of God. Center ourselves in the hope of Jesus. It's a new horizon. It's a new horizon. And I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on. Santa knew all my fears and doubts.
From the darkness I call your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out, lifted me up How great is your love bore my weakness you took my shame buried my burden in fields of grace you call me out lifting me up how great is your love from the height to heaven step down to earth in a sand perfection gave your life for us and we are amazed yeah we stand in awe for we have been changed by the power of the cross how great how great how great is your love how great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. In your kindness, in your kindness, you lead me home. In your presence. Where I belong, you call me out, lifting me up. How great is your love! From the heights of heaven, you step down to earth in a sand perfection. You gave your life for us, and we are.
Let the words I speak be honoring my everything and offering I pray. Let my life bring praise. My
we say to you now that we do want to give you glory with our lives. Oh, but there's so much going on around us that makes us scared. Or maybe we've messed up this week. Maybe we look at our own track record and we say, God, we just don't know if we can do it on our own. Maybe it was even this morning as we were trying to get ready to tune in. Maybe we yelled at our kids or maybe we... Um, looked at something last night that we shouldn't have. Maybe we got angry. We were bitter, resentful for our neighbor that might be doing a little bit better than us on the outside. Um, and God, we just feel like we're not doing a good job of giving you glory. We're not giving a good, doing a good job of giving you credit. But God, you comfort us and you remind us that you love us anyway. You meet us where we are. show us that you're with us by the person of Jesus that came and lived in this world, put on flesh and bone, and experienced all the things that we've gone through, all the anxiety, all the uncertainty, the anger, the fear. So God, we're grateful that you are with us. So God, we bring all the messiness to you now the highs and the lows the things we're proud of and the things that we feel shame and guilt for and God we trust that you'll embrace us and you'll give us your love show us your mercy and you'll see us through what a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Hey, good morning, Vineyard family. It's good to be here as we worship together. I hope that your phase one is off to a great start. Before we get rolling this morning, I do want to give you one quick update. You know, as many of you are probably aware by now, Phil's son, Brian, was recently diagnosed with ALS. And so for the last few weeks, Phil and Deb and Brian and Christy and the kids have taken some time away uh, just to talk through the decisions that they're going to have to navigate together. And so I would encourage you to continue to pray for them, that they have wisdom and understanding for what's to come. And most of all, know that Phil and I are in conversation throughout the week, and I can tell you this, that he's excited. He's really excited to be back with us soon. So throughout the quarantine, uh, I've made it a personal mission to try and find, well, stories of good news, uh, stories of hope, stories uh, of just the goodness of humanity in the news. I don't know about you, but most of the time when I watch the news, it seems like it's just pervaded with fear and gives me anxiety and causes me to feel the division that we have in our country. And so 
I'm trying to find the good stuff. So I thought I'd share one of the good things I saw this week. Justin Welby is the Archbishop of Canterbury. So what does that mean for us? Justin Welby is the head of the Anglican Church around the world. So if I could simplify it even more, basically, he's like the Protestant Pope. He's a really big deal. And in the United Kingdom, he's such a big deal that he actually has a seat in the House of Parliament so that the government there can ask him questions about life and ethics. I mean, he's a really powerful and influential figure around the world. And like London, or like here in London, they have the same sort of ideas about wearing masks, that, that it's a helpful thing to wear a mask when we're out in public. And so there have been these stories that have started coming out of one of the hardest hit areas of London about a masked chaplain who's gone above and beyond the call for people. There's the stories of a masked chaplain who, who's staying late into the night to meet with families. And there's stories of, of this masked chaplain who's been notorious for making sure that loved ones who are isolated from one another in the hospital are able to communicate. There's been stories of this masked chaplain who's taken it upon himself to bring groceries to the elderly and the isolated in this community. It's quite incredible. And the whole thing, well, what made it really interesting was the fact that he's been anonymous throughout all of this, this masked chaplain. Until recently, somebody wrote in a letter this week to the BBC saying that the masked chaplain had been coming to their house every week and delivering groceries and taking time to hear their prayers. And the woman said that while she was praying with the masked chaplain, actually his mask slipped. And it was none other than Justin Welby. That's right, the Protestant Pope was delivering her groceries every single week and hearing her prayers. This man with more power and influence than most of us will ever have in our life has chosen in this time that the best thing he could do is to be with people. Honestly, the story reminds me of something that Jesus would do. Doesn't that sound like Jesus to you? You know, in, in the book of Hebrews, it's a letter that's written to Christ followers who've been going through the ringer. They face pressure externally, there's infighting, there's division, they're all tired and exhausted, and most of all, they just want life to return to normal before the hardship and persecution that they were experiencing. And in the middle of it all, they have all of these questions. I mean, they're wondering where Jesus is in all of this. I mean, does he hear our prayers still? Has he simply gone to heaven and forgotten about us? Or is there something more to this Jesus thing? You know, if we're honest, I think we've asked a lot of those questions. I have during the pandemic. Jesus, where are you in all of this? But I want you to hear how the writer of Hebrews answers some of those questions. In chapter 4, he says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have the one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. As you and I live in the middle of a pandemic, as we begin to navigate phase one, as we come to grips with all that life has thrown at us in addition to the virus, it's natural to ask the same questions that the Hebrews were asking. But like them, we're not left to our own devices. We're not left alone to figure out this life today. Jesus has not forgotten about us. And better yet, he's closer than we ever imagined, and he's more attuned to our lives than we ever thought he was. In fact, he knows our needs better than we know them ourselves. It turns out, as the writer of Hebrews says, that Jesus is actively working on our behalf today. I'm not sure why, but for a long time, I operated under the assumption that, that when Jesus was resurrected and then he ascended into heaven, that well, that he just got busy with heavenly things. I mean, I imagine if I went to heaven, I'd just get busy with heavenly things. So surely Jesus was well, doing heaven stuff, like using his carpentry skills to build houses for the saints. I mean, the New Orleans saints. And, and he was playing spades with David and Moses and Elijah. And occasionally he looked down, but for the most part, there was so much to be done in heaven. Well, 
that his time was occupied. But the author of Hebrews says that that just isn't true. That Jesus hasn't turned his attention to heavenly matters. That he hasn't left us to figure out what it means to live life today on our own. Instead of all the things that Jesus could be doing, he's decided to take an active role in our lives today. That he's deeply invested in the goings on of our lives. To use the New Testament terminology that we see in Hebrews 4, Jesus has become our great high priest. I mean, but what exactly does that mean for us? What does that look like for us that Jesus is our great high priest? Well, the first is this, that Jesus is fully human and understands us. Jesus is fully human and understands us. In the early church, some folks made the mistake of thinking that once Jesus was resurrected, that he threw off his humanity and he just became fully God. And in doing so, he became untouchable and he was no longer like us, but that allowed him to go to heaven. But that simply isn't true. I know for large portions of my own life, I felt that way. That I've always looked as Jesus, I've always looked to Jesus as a symbol of, of what it looks like in resurrection, that Jesus was merely an example of what it kind of looked like to be human. But I always thought he was sort of superhuman. But across the entire New Testament, including the passage that we're reading today, it is unequivocal and clear that Jesus is fully and gloriously human today. And yes, Jesus sits on the throne of God, but he sits there as a human being. I want you to think about that for a minute. That Jesus is just as human as you and me. Jesus is just as human as us. I think that's good news. In fact, I think that's really good news because it means that he understands us. The frustration that you've been feeling yeah, Jesus has been frustrated too. And the grief that you've experienced, yeah, Jesus knows what it's like to lose a close friend. And the laughter that wells up during family game night, yeah, Jesus has had deep laughter like that as well. Jesus totally and completely understands us. You see, when Jesus represents us before the Father as the great high priest, he isn't looking down on us from some great height, sort of patronizing us poor creatures here on earth. No, he can truly sympathize and empathize with us because he is human. A couple of years back, I lost a couple of close people in my life. And to be honest with you, I was struggling with the grief. I was not processing it well. And a friend of mine suggested that I see a therapist, that I go to counseling. And so that's what I did. I started seeing a counselor every week for the better part of a year. And the counselor was a great dude, but he was just, well, he's pretty stoic, honestly. Most of the time I'd walk in, I'd sit on the sofa, he'd say, how, you're, how are you doing? And I'd just start talking. And very occasionally he'd ask a clarifying question. I mean, Hunter seemed really reserved, if I could say it that way. Until one day when I was sharing just about losing my father and that one of the things I was missing was this pastime of, of watching football games and, and going to football games with him. And I remember I looked up from sharing and Hunter was seated across from me and he had started crying. And this guy that had been so stoic throughout the whole process just had tears rolling down his face. And he shared with me that he had just recently lost his dad too. And that that was their pastime as well. And in that moment, all the ideas that he had given me to implement, all the ways that he was teaching me to deal with grief, I finally could accept him. Not because of anything I did, but because for the first time, I felt like he really understood me. That at least for a moment, he understood the exact thing that I was feeling. See, Jesus completely and totally understands us, which means that there's no need for pretense. 
and there's no need for facades, and there's no need for excuses. There's no need to clean up your emotions at the door. There's no need to suppress your anger when you're around him, and there's nothing that's off limits when you pray to Jesus. There's no need to rationalize your hurt away because he will never be scared off by us because he totally and completely understands us. And because he is fully human like you and me, we can bring the good and the bad and the ugly to him and know that we will be accepted as his own. As Mark and Ethan said earlier, bring all that you are to him. Bring all that you are to Christ. And it's from his deep understanding and his empathy for us that he hears us. That's the second thing. That Jesus hears our prayers and listens compassionately. Jesus hears our prayers and listens compassionately. Have you ever prayed and felt like your prayers were just bouncing off the ceiling and coming right back to you? Have you ever prayed and thought, is anybody listening out there? Have you ever prayed and said, are you there? I mean, the truth is, Emily and I, well, we were praying that this week, just as some of our friends have been dealt blow after blow, and it's like, man, God, we're praying, what are you doing? And where are you in this? See, when we come to pray to the Heavenly Father, when we come to pray to Jesus, we're not shouting across this great gulf, this great expanse that separates us from him. We're not trying to get the attention of someone who's too busy on their phone trying to live their life in heaven. No, when you and I come to pray to Jesus, he is there listening and interceding on our behalf. So when I feel that way, and I felt that way this week, I actually return to Hebrews 4 and I remind myself that though I may feel like no one is listening, I have a great high priest who hears our prayers and is listening compassionately that we have Christ. And though he sits on the throne of God, he has chosen to spend his time listening to us. And we have Christ who holds the very cosmos in his hands, who keeps all things moving and working together, and yet chooses to listen to our prayers about groceries and whether we'll have enough resources to pay the bills. And he hears our prayers for strength to get through the next Zoom meeting. Our God hears our prayers. He hears every single prayer. He even hears the prayers that don't have words. See, when we've run out of breath, Jesus hears us. And when our prayers are simply the tears that we cry, Jesus hears us. And when we have groans of pain and anguish and frustration, Jesus hears us. When the newborn child squeals with joy at the sight of her mother and father, Jesus hears us. When we have no words, Jesus hears us. And when we sing songs, Jesus hears us. When we pray eloquently, Jesus hears us. When we stutter and stumble, Jesus hears us. When we pray the same prayer over and over again before every meal, Jesus hears us. When those who have developmental disorders laugh with joy, Jesus hears us. When we pray with muffled sounds because of masks, Jesus hears us. And though they may not make sense to us, Jesus understands. One of my first jobs uh, as a pastor was actually at this Kenyan church. And I remember I was asked to go to a lady's home an elderly lady and she had a couple of deformities which made it hard to understand her and to top it all off she was from Kenya and well she spoke Kenyan and I remember going over to hear her prayers and I didn't know what she was saying I didn't even know why I was there but it gives me great comfort to know that even when I couldn't understand even when we couldn't understand that Jesus heard her and that Jesus understood her. See, Jesus hears our prayers and listens compassionately. But don't be confused about it. Jesus isn't just some cosmic therapist. 
And Jesus isn't just the greatest listener for all of eternity. It's not simply that Jesus hears our prayers. It's that he responds to them that he is moved to action on our behalf. See, as the great high priest, Jesus is pouring out mercy and grace to sustain each of us. Jesus is pouring out mercy and grace to sustain each of us. In verse 16, the author of Hebrews concludes by saying that when we approach God in prayer, he is deeply moved and responds. So much so that when we need it most, he meets us with mercy and grace that every prayer, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how mundane, no matter how odd, Jesus hears and responds. What are those words? With mercy and grace. Words that we as Christ followers talk about and we hear all the time mercy and grace. But what does it mean? That Jesus pours out mercy. Jesus pours out the unmerited favor and goodness of God upon us. That he is pouring out the unconditional love, the unconditional forgiveness of God upon us. That Jesus is setting us free from the sin and the mess and the evil of this world, and he's doing it of his own accord. He's doing it freely. And even though we would otherwise sink without him, he has chosen to step into the world and free us. We receive mercy. And then he pours out grace, the all-encompassing, empowering presence of God with us today. The presence of God that has made its home in us through the Spirit. The presence of God that sweeps us up into the divine dance of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The presence of God that strengthens us even in our moments of our greatest weakness. The presence of God that sets our feet on the rock. The presence of God that helps us to walk in his ways and bring his kingdom into the world today. We will find mercy and grace when we need it the most. N.T. Wright sums it up nicely when he says it this way. He says, mercy covers all that has been and grace covers all that is and all that will be. Mercy covers all that has been. Every second that has brought me to this moment is covered with mercy. Every failing, every triumph, Everything that has made you and I, us, is covered by mercy. And as we live in this present moment and step into the future unknown, there is grace. There is the empowering presence of God with us. See, there's not a single moment in our life that God hasn't been present. And there's not a single prayer that we've prayed that he hasn't heard. And even when we couldn't see it, our whole lives, our whole lives were filled to the brim and running over with his mercy and his grace. So as the writer says, don't lose hope. Hold firmly to the faith that you've received. Vineyard Church, do not give up. Do not give in and do not lose sight of the great high priest that we have in Christ Jesus and continue to approach the throne of God. For it's in his presence that you are totally safe. And it's in his presence that you are totally loved. And it's in his presence that you are totally and completely understood both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, you know the needs that we have. Father, you know the things that have been on our hearts and our minds. You know the fears and the anxieties that we carry. And in this moment, we admit that we need your mercy and your grace. We need your mercy to cover everything that's been in our lives.
And we need your grace. We need your grace to sustain us. You know, as a matter of fact, if you find yourself this morning in need of mercy and grace, I mean, if that's you, it's really simple. Why don't you just comment and say, that's me. If you're in need of mercy and grace this morning, why don't you comment and say, that's me. And one of our pastors will reach out to you. If that feels uncomfortable, maybe it feels too public, why don't you just send us a direct message and say, I need help. I need mercy and grace. Because it's there for you. It's there for me. It's there for us. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. And what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And I want you to hear these words. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. And oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Bring all that you are to him and you will find all that you need now and forever. Amen. Amen. You guys have a wonderful Sunday. Can't wait to see you soon. If you'd like to give as an act of worship, you can give online at vcno.org slash give or by texting any dollar amount to the number 84321. If you're new to the Vineyard, and maybe you've just been more plugged in online over the last few weeks, then make sure to fill out a Connect card at vcno.org slash connect. If you're part of our Vineyard family and you're in need of financial assistance, please be sure to check out vcno.org slash finances. Whether it's a bill you're struggling with or an insurance payment, we'd love to try and help you out. Have a great Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you this Wednesday night for our midweek service.